a top right corner and see if it gives you a chance. Hello, this is John Reed. We are live with a special ESG blowout as promised. This is going to be good. This is the ESG research reveal with Brian Summer. Brian, welcome. Good to be here, John. And um, uh, all I ask is let's see if you can be on your best behavior today. Uh, <laughs> I know. I know that's this is half the problem, and, and the problem is I have like a head of steam about this issue, and I do have to issue a couple of ground rules. We may have a special guest joining us later, though we're doing this on a bad time zone for our for our guests. So, but Brian Brian is the is the focal point here because Brian's written a book on ESG that's really changed my thinking on the topic, and I hope by the time this show is done, it's changed your thinking a little bit also. So we're going to get into that in much more detail. Uh, but just real quick, I just want to say, um, you know, I think one uh, one thing to think about is, is could ESG actually be that dark horse next important thing in enterprise software? Because I know for damn sure it's not the metaverse web three crap. <laughs> and, and we're obsessed over generative AI right now. But one interesting thing to think about is whether ESG could indeed be that next thing. So, Brian, I think you'll have a comment about that as we go. But um, the one thing I wanted to say is that this is not the bland, hypocritical sustainability mission statements of old. And, you know, for the next hour or so, my only real ground rule is I don't care about how anyone feels about climate change or whether ESG is some kind of woke uh, movement or something like that. That's completely irrelevant to our topic here today. If you want to corner me to bar sometime, we can have it out over those topics. I happen to feel pretty strongly about the moral and ethical aspects of this. But here's what's changed. What's changed, and, and I think this is where Brian's going to factor in here with his work, is this is no longer something you can you can put aside on some niche constituency or try to say, oh, I'm above that. This is something that's going to confront every organization. And, and that's perhaps in some ways people will see that as bad news. But there's also really good news here because it's about making your supply chains actually better and and actually improving your bottom line in some really interesting ways as energy costs continue to rise and stuff like that. So, so Brian, shall we embrace those ground rules and stay away from the political debates and kind of focus on what matters to businesses here? I have absolutely no interest in going into the politics. Uh, and, and the reason being is that this stuff is being driven by an incredible amount of uh, increasing regulation and rules that are coming from one country after another after another. So it almost is irrelevant what you believe. It's um, what is your company going to do about it? That's really what this is all about. And uh, I, I actually spent a little bit of time at the front end of this book, actually touching on the point you're bringing up, John, which is I know there are people with some very strong opinions, but let me just put this put a few things aside. I don't, I'm not turning the book into some political manifesto. I'm just talking about what is it an executive needs to do if you're going to uh, have a success around dealing with these ESG regulations and some of the changes you're going to have to make up and down your value chain and supply chain. It's complicated stuff because as it turns out, um, and again, no disrespect to anybody in your own personal opinions, but if you ask, for example, a lawyer, what is ESG? Well, it's a legal issue. If you ask an accounting person, what is? Well, it's a finance issue, and I could go down the list. There's a, everybody's got an opinion what it is. I can tell you two things it's not. It's not an emissions-only issue. Some people think it's strictly about emissions. That's not it at all. It's much broader. There's three pieces, you know, environmental. Oh, Tom's weighing in. Good to see Tom. Um, uh, there's the social piece, and it's not, social is not just diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI. It's a lot broader than that, and so forth around governance. So this is, this. there's a lot to unpack here, and I hate to admit this, but I thought a year and a half, two years ago, I could probably knock a booklet out on this thing, an executive guidebook out in three months, 75, 80 pages. The final products, I think 260 odd pages. And it took me the better part, like I said, of a year and a half to, you know, to two years to get it done because it just is that complicated, not complicated. It's that um, 
nuance. There's just so much there to get your head around. And more importantly, whatever you think about technology and ERP and everything else, everything you're used to dealing with was designed around one way of uh, collecting information, one kind of information you want to collect. And the stuff you need for ESG, a lot of it is not going to be in your favorite accounting software product. Right. And and Tom, uh, Ralph, very nice to see you here. And we'll be hearing from Tom Moore, I think, if you can stay awake for us here. Sorry to keep you up, Tom. Tom says 100% agree with Brian. This is far more about regs than politics. And, and look, I mean, I, I'm kind of like, I get pretty impatient. I just saw this really crap blog on LinkedIn by so-called futurist, like about how, you know, climate change isn't man-made, all that, all that kind of crap. I get really impatient with that, but I also get impatient with greenwashing as well. And the so-called good people that are doing good things. And, and, and up to, up to now it hasn't added up to much in many ways besides mission statements. But Brian, I don't think that's going to last much longer. And we published a piece on Diginomica. I'm not going to name the vendor because I don't want to get into like, like vendor promo, but the quote was nobody's well prepared with very few exceptions. And I'm going to read this quote from you, Brian, and see says this vendor has some of the best people in the world on their team, on their sustainability team, on their compliance team. And it even makes our head spin the alphabet soup, the constant emerging standards, the difference between regional standards. We have EU corporate sustainability reporting directive. We have SEC Australia and the UK is no longer part of the EU. It's mind blowing. Is that along the lines of kind of what you're digging out from this book? Uh, the fog index on all the different standards groups. In fact, there's so many that at the back end of the uh, book, I actually put a like additional resources. And there's like a page and a half of some of these international or country specific standards groups that are out there. I don't have enough time in my life to go through and read all that kind of stuff. It's it's beyond chewy. It's bureaucratic regulation is what you know the way it reads, and you you know it's a, it's not exciting stuff to go through. Um, I'm not I'm not going to try and parse that out. Uh, you know, and the other thing is it keeps moving and changing all the time as well. So uh, there's a little value I think in in saluting that kind of stuff at all. To the first prior point you were making, though, uh, John, there is uh, there is a lot of stuff that was what I would call discretionary reporting that companies used to talk about. They tout all their nice stuff, and uh, that was under the guise of um, uh, corporate social re reporting kind of stuff. And um, uh, companies chose what they did uh, report and what they didn't want to report, and they cast a pretty interesting narrative. The new regulations make it a lot harder for companies to just tell one side of a story now. Now they have to tell it all. I see Tom's back in here. Yep, Tom says it's massively complex, but more than that is that it, it is incredibly immature and changing day by day. Tom will get back to that comment in a minute. Uh, for those of you who are arriving a little bit late, welcome. Your comments are starting to pop up. And uh, Brian, I want to save your major book plug to the end, but we do we do need to answer this basic question, <laughs> yeah, which is what Dan Aldridge. Uh, by the way, Dan's been putting out a lot of good content on LinkedIn on ERP related stuff, so I recommend following him. Dan says, "What's the name of the book, Brian? I joined a little late. Sorry." And 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 also, Brian, just say tell everyone when it's coming out so they know. Yeah, so the book will be coming out next month. So uh, it'll be out on Amazon. It's the executive's ESG playbook is what it is. And I have some nice cover art and I've got all the ISBN numbers. Everything is all set up and ready to go. Um, and thanks, Maureen. Uh, every, uh, anyway, we'll... Um, I'll be sure and let everyone know this is kind of the earliest debut. This is the debutante party, if you will, for this, except uh, I don't have all the dressing gown and everything else for the book at this point. I'd love to be able to pass out copies and all that, but I'm not quite to that point yet. But the good news for all of y'all who are checking this out is we're getting the sneak preview, the exclusive, and you don't have to sign a friggin' NDA or anything like that. No. Brian's going to dish the skinny for you here. Uh, let's see what Josh has to say. Part of the problem is also nomenclature. Sustainability is an overly large term that's used to cover too many types of initiatives under a single umbrella. Indeed, we could add diversity and inclusion to that mix in some capacity as well, including supplier screening. And by the way, I think there's two other there's two other things I want to get to, and then 
And then soon we're going to have Brian walk us through some key points. But the, the two things, Brian, that really jump out at me, one is this, this notion that there's less and less external externalities. Like in the past, corporations could kind of move certain things off the books and more and more, especially when it comes to supply chain accountability, that's extending into what you call scope two and scope three, but basically beyond your typical supply chain levels of accountability in the past. So that is a, is another sort of quote unquote terrifying aspect in terms of it's not just the regulations, it's the things that you're now being held responsible for that in the past you just weren't, um, which I personally see as a good thing, but anyhow, it, it's real. Oh, it is. Um, let me do this. Let me see if I can get the slide to come up and oh, I don't. Oh yeah, folks, we have slides. Brian, I'll, I'll add it to the stream. There we go. Thank you. Yep. So just for definitional purposes, when you cut all the way through it, uh, of the three pieces of ESG, what a lot of people think about, and this is kind of to uh, Josh's comment a moment ago, people think about either emissions or sustainability, and, and they're mostly talking about environmental factors, the stuff on the far left. This is, you know, this aspect or component of ESG is really about how your company interacts with the rest of the planet on a, like a very natural kind of level. And you can see some of the categories of things you have to report underneath that. The things that get a lot less attention are on the social and governance side, and in particular, figuring out what goes where, if you will. Uh, that kind of troubled me for a while, and I found a bunch of different kinds of definitions and opinions and some heavily regulated stuff that you could just, frankly, you need to go take it down to a witch doctor and have them do an incantation or exorcism on it to figure out what they break there meant. But what I learned is really the way to think about the social piece of it, it's about relationships. It's about the way your company interacts with its own employees, with its suppliers, its customers, and most importantly, maybe with the suppliers of the suppliers and so forth, all the way down the you know, number of tiers you've got in your supply chain. And what you're trying to find out is, is everybody paying livable wages? Are they, uh, do they avoid using forced labor, prison labor, whatever. Are they dealing, are they on some kind of restricted entities list? Those kind of things. That's what you've got to be digging into on the social side. And honestly, there's not a lot of parts to most organizations that really deal with this. Um, you will find like the supply chain procurement people, they may go down to some of the key suppliers one level deep in your supply chain, but they don't know the rest of that going down you know, the hill. And then on the governance side, those are the things that you do to make sure that your company actually honors the spirit and letter of what you're trying to do in your societal kind of actions, and you maintain that trust. And um, that's where you have to really focus in on, like, can we trust our supplier? Do they do they bribe government officials, those kind of things? And have you got mechanisms to check for those um, and check and prevent those kind of activities from happening? So at a definitional deal, after a year and a half, I'm just telling you, this is the cleanest way I found to just kind of, you know, put this thing in different buckets so you know which one you're going to work on. And candidly, what I think one of the biggest ahas for a lot of companies is how HR has to be right there in the center on the social stuff. And I'm not sure they have the people, the systems and so forth to do a lot of that right now. Anyway, that's a big surprise. All right. So shall we hold the rest of the slides for now? No, we, we might as well go through them. We don't okay. have a lot of time. Um, well, just, just before you do that, I wanted to throw one more thing into the mix and, and hit a couple of comments here. The, the final piece of the puzzle to me that we haven't mentioned is is kind of the good, exciting, but also confusing part of all this that also comes out in your book, which is there's also, a, a, I guess you could call it kind of a next generation ESG vendor emerging, which also includes classic sustainability players that are trying to up their game. But it's basically, as I see it, a move towards much more effective use of of so-called ESG principles by integrating them into real-time transactional flows by adding things like like carbon trackers and energy trackers into your day-to-day -day and essentially having this sort of real-time approach to this topic instead of scrambling after the fact to figure out how you screwed up at the end of the year. Mm. Um, but, but the catch being, 
uh, and I think this came out in one of Tom's comments, is that a lot of these vendors are immature. And if you're a customer, I guess, Brian, you experience this while you're researching, there's still a dizzying array of vendors to make sense of in this space that's emerging. So I think that's a really interesting topic also. Yeah, I I looked at well over 40 different kind of products that are out there. A bunch of them are more like templates that have integrations to your existing systems and can get some of the elements out of your existing systems and map them into different fields on regulatory reports. Uh, that's not going to be enough. There's another group of a smaller group of players that um, have these nice utilities that go out and pull your supply chain members and can find information about their ownership, their labor practices and so forth, and may even have some kind of audit service to go out and verify, you know, in country what these firms are really doing. Um, there's not a lot of technology really on the governance side. Um, there are some that are emerging on a couple of the big ERP companies and you know, the only one I can say by name that's got something going is like SAP. There are some others that have some things going in the background that are going to try and create uh, new kinds of uh, ledgers that use more granular kind of information to your point. I'll talk a little bit more about the granularity maybe if we got time later on the podcast. Yeah, I think the granularity part is actually a really big deal. Uh, from, from your report, you talked actually about SAP and you said that they produced a short video on their control tower that addresses the granularity of data and how their ESG products can capture water, gas, electric consumption, waste, and emissions at each step along the production process. And then to the point of this immaturity, at the time of writing, you said it's unknown whether this extends beyond the bill of materials or can get into an individual lot batch or product level. And I'm sitting here thinking like, if you can get to the point where vendors can offer you that type of granularity at that level, that really changes how you think about this topic. And it's one reason why I, why I always said in the beginning of the show, like forget about the friggin' metaverse and Web3, start paying attention to this. So let's take that a little bit further. In 2018, 2019, I had a couple of colleagues join me and we did a project for a major global manufacturer. And one of their things was they were going to be building a factory of the future. They wanted to use as much as they could on like IoT and those kind of technologies, but they really wanted to get precision around what things cost because they the best they could do in their whole firm was tell you that a ton of the product that they make cost anywhere from between 40 something dollars US to $128 US, depending on which plant. That's as, as accurate as they could get. That's it. They had no idea how much carbon dioxide they off gas. They had no idea about their transportation cost. I go down the list. They didn't know any of it. So back then, uh, in 2019, I remember I'm giving this presentation to the executive committee, and I'm talking about how they need to put uh, how if you drove up behind the back of any of their plants, you saw there was one electric meter, one gas meter, and one water meter. And so there's no way in the world they know how much any of those components go into any of the individual products that they made. And at some point in the briefing, the CEO stops me and he's like, so we need to buy scales, meters, switches, valving, and we need to change our cost accounting system. And he rattled off a few more things. I go, precisely. Now, when I was working on this book, I got to thinking because of this granularity issue, did, did we put a challenge out there that was a little bit too far with the application software vendors not be able to get to this point. And I actually breathed a sigh of relief knowing that that um, SAP and one other vendor are working already on this same problem. So if we were anything, we were a couple of years early. But I can tell you, we've all seen this movie. Everybody on this call seen this movie in the enterprise software space where first you have a system that captures data about transactions that already happened. Then you try and get the stuff in real time. And then you start focusing on having more predictive and future-oriented capabilities. So right now where we are in ESG and the capability of most companies and their technology is we're still stuck in the past dealing with annual averaged or aggregated data. We need to start getting it more granular in real time then we'll be able to put some predictive horsepower behind it in the years to come. Yeah, I would argue we're, we're still many years behind where we should be, but I, I'm not going to deny that these trends are encouraging because they are. Let's let's run through some uh, comments here. Sorry, folks, that I sure. 
your, left your comments out for a few. Tracy Webster says, I'm not an expert in this space, but given how immature this all is, seeing all the badges and statements on websites and in conferences is starting to feel a little more like marketing. Yeah, it's always nice when the substance starts to catch up a little bit with the, with the marketing. Uh, Thomas, good day indeed. Uh, Tom says CSR, CSR generally reported up to the CMO, which tells its only story. Ouch. I'll, I'll give a Tom a big thumbs up on that. Um, and I don't have it for today's webinar deal, but I did have, I have a slide. I think it's, I think it made it in the book and it talks about uh, some of the statements. Yes, Josh, I'll give you an autograph copy of one. I, I'm sure I'll see you a hundred times over the, uh, this fall at all the different events in the West Coast. Oh, and Tom's adding to that, that he, the rigor starting to be demanded means the reporting is likely going to migrate to the CFO. Uh, Tom's actually touching on a very interesting point. Uh, you know, the um, traditionally, I think a lot of chief sustainability officers have had this kind of land on them, but um, I can I can certainly see both the chief HR officer and the chief financial officer being two of the individuals who are going to take a very heavy role on this. The finance folks, because of the precision that's going to be desired from uh, product costing. And we need to reevaluate what is um, what does fully loaded costing mean? Because you might want to start attaching like a carbon tax if, or whatever surcharge on the different products based on the profiles each one of them has on how far the products are transported uh, and um, how, what kind of emissions come out of them, what you're going to have to do to remediate them. Uh, so there's a lot on the finance side, and it is going to be end up in SEC kind of reporting in the U.S. So somebody's got to sign off on those statements. And on the HR side, all the things dealing with the social issues are going to be critical, too. Speaking of which, Maureen says, dear God, HR, absolutely not competent in this space. Uh, we could probably spend 10 or 15 minutes on that. Let's not <laughs> so, do that right now. Uh, well, but... But I feel your observation, Maureen. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, Brian just wrote an extensive piece on, on the state of HR into Genomica that ties into that. So check that out. Thomas says uh, he, he may be jumping the gun, but did you look for or find evidence that adhering to ESG principles is good for revenue or profit? You can maybe work that into some of the presentation stuff as we go also, but feel free to briefly comment on that. Short answer is... Um, uh, there's the short term impact may be a little hard to see, but the longer term deal is clearly there for doing it. And uh, uh, the short term stuff might be expedient, but it's going to come back and bury uh, people. The same thing with some of the claims some companies make. And I don't know if this is where Maureen was going earlier, but there are, there are folks who make all kinds of wild claims and, uh, the one that troubles me the most, and John, you're going to be the one who probably gloms onto this one. I love the kind of CEO today that promises his firm is going or her firm is going to be net zero by like 2030 and generating net positive by 2050. The problem is how many CEOs do we know are actually going to still be in their job by 2030, let alone 2050? It's easy to make a hollow promise that you have no intention of ever you know, complete because you're not going to be in the job. Well, and most of the CEOs I've heard that have made those promises run highly scalable software and technology companies, and I've yet to hear them say we're going to help our customers get there by a given date, uh, but sorry to be the, the downbeat individual. <laughs> Tom says granularity is absolutely key. Uh, I think so, too. Thank, thanks, Tom. Uh, that makes me feel a whole lot better because for a whole middle chunk of the book, so thank you for that. And Marine's with me on uh, blasting the metaverse and Web3 out of the water. Um, and and I'm going to throw generative AI in there, too, in the sense like what I was saying in the beginning. Like, if you allow yourself to get so caught up in that narrative, that's um, you're exactly going to miss stuff. That's exactly the point my chatbot just made, uh, John. So, <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're getting prompted as we speak. Uh, <laughs> All Tom, right. says, uh, Tom says the EU's fit for the 2030 mandate means this is going to be absolute top of agenda for orgs in the EU for the next six years. Tom, I would add, though, that there's a lot of U.S.-based companies that do enough business in that geography that it's going to get sticky for more companies than that just dealing with the EU. But, yeah, absolutely. Brian, let me just whip through the rest of these. We're almost to the yeah, end. Yeah, I know. We, 
So I did want to tell you that, you know, there's a big sprint uh, that a lot of companies go through right now. And I think this has got to go away. Uh, This is indicative of a company who's got an annual manual spreadsheet and paper driven kind of process. And that might have helped you get through the finish line for meeting some immediate regulatory requirements. But it's not going to be the way it's going to work long term. And you want a nice graphic, by the way. I like the. Yeah, happy to. I, I get that sense of the sprint coming out there. Um, I mentioned this at the top, you know, depending on who you are as an executive, kind of flavor is how you see ESG. And um, uh, one of the more fascinating things about doing this book, it's made me talk to a bunch of people that I normally don't run in the same circle with. So I've talked with chemists and scientists and um, uh attorneys, you name it. And uh, it's been fascinating hearing how they see all this ESG, if you will, from their point of view. And some of them, I think probably that I talked with probably need a, a whatever, a refresher course on things, but it is what it is. And you're going to run into that in your own firm. And that would be a message I'd take to anyone who's watching this or reads the book is that uh, it's all the different dimensions and all the different kinds of motivations and the opinions that people have. And I find it really fascinating. Instead of folks actually going to see what do the regulations want, they're already just forming opinions about what they think they ought to do. And I I think that's kind of a dangerous way to run a business. So there's that. I think it was Tom or somebody was talking about CSR, corporate social responsibility. And what's to give me just to paint a picture of these are the kind of things people would emphasize depending on a lot of times what kind of firm you are. So if you're a global firm, you talk about all the way you give back to local communities and, you know, rural poor locations. But if you're the pizza joint down the street, you're talking about, hey, we'll give uh, free college tuition to somebody who works here part time, you know, for three or four years. Um, and so what you had is people cherry pick the things that they wanted to talk about that we were the most relevant for them, their firm, their industry, or they talked about things that were going to put them in the best possible light until a point I made earlier. That was then. That's not the focus of like ESG reporting now and going forward. By the way, uh, Tom said, I think, for, for your previous slide, that the board are missing. The board is missing from that slide. That's just his comment. Well, yeah, I, I kind of was running out of real estate. There's a ton of others I probably could have put on there, too. Uh, but, yeah, I, I accept that. You know, there's, yeah, we uh, go, you could have gone for even Wall more, Street, more yeah, complexity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, I was – what is it? I'm just trying to make a point. I'm not trying to, you know, I wasn't trying to re- replace, you know, a hundred pages worth of the book with this one slide, but um, he's right. All right, Brian, sorry to make you backtrack anyway. So when I was talking about the selective reporting earlier, you know, take a look at one of these. Like, so you added 3000 net new employees globally, but what a lot of companies would do is they forgot to mention conveniently that they hired 10,000 people in low cost countries and terminated 7,000 in high cost locations. When you focus on the social aspect for ex- that these are focused on and you're, you're selectively choosing which facts you want to report in the old days, you tended to gloss over the things about the kind of impact you were having in communities around the world based on some of your other decisions. The net number is not always necessarily the correct number to focus in on. You're going to talk about what are you doing in those communities that you operate in. You're the good steward in all those communities or you're not. Anyway, this is just an example of selective reporting. That's all this was intended to show. And then let's talk about for the enterprise software people on here. If you look at that kind of coral pink colored box, most of the software many companies have, like ERP products, are designed to take information out of plants, factories, distribution warehouses, whatever, and flow it up to intergalactic world headquarters. Um, I'm still not sure where Diginomicas is, uh, but uh, I guess it's in England. But uh, uh, You'd have to sign an NDA, Brian. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyway, um, but that's that coral box was kind of like where most of the information exists and the way the information moved. It moved from the shop floor up, if you will. 
But when you look at what ESG is about, it starts all the way back like into factory farms and it wants to know everything about what it took to grow the crop, to transport it to market, to some intermediate mills, processing centers, whatever, how it got transported to the next place and so forth until it finally made it to your firm. And the reason that's important is because about uh, uh, your firm may, if it produces X amount of emissions, 11X is generated uh, generally on the, all that stuff to the left of your firm on the value on the supply chain. Uh, then moving forward, once you get through making something, then you've got to transport, it gets out to customers, may go through some additional, you know, distributors, whatever. So there's energy and fuel costs. There's also packaging that's generated and has to be disposed of. So if that's the flow running in the white band there, then this gray band shows all the things that are being thrown off from this that impact things from a social perspective. And what do we got to look for? You know, what do we know about uh, the different kinds of uh, labor being used, uh, the labor treatment of their livable wages? What are we doing to impact the community and not go all the way down? That's the gray line. And the dark blue line, your band, those are some of the other byproducts of the process that are not that hot. In the book, I'm Brian, um, mm. Brian, can I just ask you a question from the, sure. from the, from the, I was going to say the peanut gallery, but the peanut gallery is like actually really probably smarter than we are. So it's awkward. Um, Josh asks, um, in the book, do you deal with the issue of what level of tech infrastructure is needed to stay on top of this? A certain large leading vendor just said this kind of accounting is only available from their cloud products, meaning on-premise customers are shit out of luck. Your thoughts? Oh. Yeah, I think the, uh, the on-prem ones are really at a disadvantage. Uh, yes. Um, that said, uh, for all that stuff you want to capture that's maybe coming out of the supply chain, that stuff clearly needs to be moving through and, you know, through a cloud solution. That's probably the best way to make it happen. And maybe the same thing on the value chain side, what you do inside your firm is kind of could still be your own business, uh, but uh, you still got to bring all this together and you're going to need warehouses and other kind of stuff to deal with it. Okay. Here's Josh's comment. Yeah. I just put it up on the screen for the, for the video replay folks. I, I, I think I already know who that vendor is. Uh, and I would say, um, uh, I know why, I know why they want to do it in the cloud because it's a great place to pull together all of these other data points, most of which are going to originate from outside the firm. So they're going to have to find a way to marry that with their in, internal data that's uh, running on the on-prem stuff. Ryan and talks Ryan. about Ryan talks about how some industries are easier to net zero. Some scope three carbon emissions are especially challenging to track and verify due to the nature of the data, uh, for sure. Which kind of ties into the whole theme I think of this discussion, which is how the scope of this is brought in so much. Um, there's also a question from Dan. It's kind of SAP specific. I'd kind of prefer to not just talk about SAP here, but talk about ERP in general, because this is a broader topic than just SAP. But he asked whether the AI capability with ERP could optimize energy efficiencies and take as input sense sensor data, for instance. Um, and Leonardo is basically a dead brand, by the way, but uh, but 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 as it's dead in the water. But SAP is obviously working hard on AI for this, as are a lot of other firms. But I think the, the the broader question I think that ties into what Dan is asking is, are ERP vendors, what kind of opportunity do they have here versus like best of breed players that can come in and do this work? So some of the some of the, the usual suspects, the ERP kind of folks, what they're doing, a, a lot of them are doing partnerships. And one of the firms you'll hear a lot of them partner with is a company called Ecovadis, E-C-O-V-A-D-I-S. And Ecovadis has all this technology that's really sophisticated to go and ping all kinds of providers back in your supply chain. So you can find out about, uh, yeah, uh, where you, you can find out uh, the ownership of the companies. Is it owned by rogue nation government, if you will? Are they using conflict minerals? Uh, you know, do they pay livable wages? Do they use forced labor? All those kind of things you can collect. Uh, it can it can be pulled up. Some of these products like theirs uh, also maintain an active database. And uh, if your supplier is already in that database, that 
cuts down how much work you have to do. In fact, one of the vendors I talked with thinks they can get uh, get most companies information about their supply chain in about 90 days. Uh, but I would tell you guys, that sounds great, but if you're uh, like a super complex manufacturer with like 13 levels deep on your supply chain and or if you use a bunch of contractors, 1099s, or your suppliers are using them, it may take you a lot longer than that to knock out. Uh, but there are specialty firms. There are some that have dashboards that map stuff in from your systems and others and put them in the report formats. And some are good for pulling information out about the supply chain. I didn't really run into a whole lot that are great on the governance side, um, although that's not going to be most companies' biggest problem. Uh, and I don't didn't see a lot that could actually tell me much about circular economy things like uh, using reusable packaging or um, returning uh, end of life products back to the manufacturer, which is a, a growth area for, for, I think, for ERP guys. All right, Brian, um, how many more slides do you have? Uh, I think that's it. That's all we need to cover. Okay. For, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so I want to spend a couple more times, a couple more minutes on on the scope of the problem. And then I think we have some momentum in the chat to get to, you know, what cutting, what cutting edge companies or smarter companies are doing about this, mm -hmm. um, which is totally fair point. We don't want to get lost in the quagmire of, of the challenges, but before we leave the quagmire, I want to make the quagmire just a little bit bigger and read something else that struck me from your report, uh, which is sort of an example of new kinds of data, but forever chemicals, just one example. I just want yeah. to read this from your report. Regulators in many countries are requiring companies to cease the use of PFAs and other chemicals, some called forever chemicals. These compounds can be found in or on gaskets, fire retardant, printed circuit boards, seals, packaging, and more. While your firm may not add to these products, your suppliers might, or they might be used in some aspect of your capital equipment. And what may be overlooked in your ESG efforts is an exposure risk for these number of compounds that can impact your production and so on. This cannot be ignored. I just think that's a another powerful sense of like what companies are getting themselves into here that they that that it's uncharted territory really and they're not ready. Yeah, the most amazing anecdote probably in the whole yeah, and Brent's right. I've got tons more slides, yes. Um uh 128 of them I think are queued up there there if we need to go that far. But excellent. Uh, but anyway, on the forever chemicals, this is a fantastic uh, point to talk about. And it never occurred to me because I kept thinking all this was really about the movement and conversion of like a raw material into a finished goods. And I'd never thought about the uh, some of the stuff in the MRO, the you know maintenance and repair kind of uh, products that go into things. And so this one guy sat me down one day and he's telling me about how they just implemented this hundred million dollar giant piece of commercial machinery at their plant only to realize it's got dozens or hundreds of these hydraulic uh, pistons and cylinders in it to help move the product through the machinery and all of those hydraulic cylinders use a particular kind of um, uh, uh, rubber seals that are all treated with uh, forever chemicals like a Teflon-like material to keep them slick, smooth, and pliable. And then he looks right at me with the most earnest eyes and he says, you know, we know those seals are going to be impossible to get hold of in about uh, October of next year because of bans. Because, and that's because they have the forever chemical on a, coating on them. So his supply chain team was currently scavenging the world, trying to find all the supply they can of those replacement parts for their MRO stock for that machinery, because they mm. can't afford to have this huge piece of capital equipment go down and stay down all for the lack of a $4 seal. So this stuff is everywhere. It takes a lot of attention to get to it. Indeed. So here's the game plan. Uh, special guest, you know who you are. You've been sent a back-end link uh, to the broadcast. Please join us in about 10 minutes. You can log in a little before if you want. We'll bring you in. Thanks if you can do it, assuming you still have your cam set up. If not, no worries. Uh, Brian, just uh, on the scope of the challenges, to I want to get to the solutions part. But just real quick, uh, Tom elaborates. To Ryan's point, the requirement to, to report scope three, especially if it's required to be audited, as the SAP said, and requests for comments last year will be game changing. It will happen. That is the direction of travel. So that's just another example of how 
this is expanding. And Tom also saying how second, third NT suppliers aren't equipped to report their emissions, and that's a huge issue. So, so those are really the challenges. Now, on the on sort of example, Brian, in terms of what people are looking for next from you here in this broadcast. Maureen says, I hope you give us a wee taste of where folks are excelling because, who oh boy, I can't see large organizations doing this well at all. <laughs> and, and I think Josh is kind of piling on here by saying data is the real issue, quality, accessibility, governance, and in his opinion, enterprise data quality sucks. It's really hard to argue that point. Any confidence this will improve and how? So that kind of gives you a sense of what people are looking for next. They want to get a sense of where the, where the smart companies are moving on this stuff. Can you put Maureen's comment back up? Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about hers, and then we'll go to uh, Josh's. All right. So, uh, Maureen, indirectly, you're hitting one of the most frustrating aspects I had dealing with the book, which was figuring out what is it we what's the approach a company should take. And it turned out I kept running into all these different kinds of approaches, but I summed up most of them into several common styles um, of um, tackling the ESG kinds of problems. And one of them is uh, that's, that I see that some of the bigger companies do is they find the big problem uh, their firm has. It's usually an emissions type of issue. Uh, and they get the reporting done. That's kind of a maintenance kind of issue. They, they have a process to get their annual ESG reports done and out the door. But they've had, a, excuse me, a specialized team that's working on getting something uh, fixed. And I'll give you a good example. Uh, did you know that about 40% of the Earth's carbon emissions are triggered by heating and cooling buildings? That's the biggest energy generator. So if you're a property owner or property management firm, that's your big great white whale. And that's what you focus uh, a whole team on and trying to figure out how you're going to bring that big number down. I've seen that approach used at some manufacturers where they have a particular process that is just a like a carbon emitting pig. And that's what they're going to focus in on. In some cases, they focus on shutting down some horribly inefficient plants and they transfer production over somewhere. So the general approach that some companies take is the reporting becomes a, a small piece of what goes on. They focus on one giant thing next. The, another approach some companies use is they're going to go in and they're going to, they suspect that the problem is downstream uh, or well, whatever direction you want to call it. It's further back in their supply chain. And so they're, they're either re-engineering products, they're changing their supplier base, or they're doing something to make that fundamental kind of change happen. And then there are others who try and just tackle a lot of things across a lot of areas. And um I, you know, you know, but that, but generally there is a prioritization process that happens and companies either go after the big one, some go after a bunch of little ones and save the big one for a while, which I'm not so sure about the wisdom of that, but, um, and then everything in between there, you know, but they are working on it. In fact, when you get past all the politics and the noise in the market, when you talk to these sustainability teams and companies, those folks are some of the most dedicated on on the subject kind of individuals I've ever run into and they're working their butts off trying to make some big changes happen. So it is happening. So take take solace, Marine, that companies are doing it. It's just you won't see the same two companies in the same industry won't have the same attack plan. And back to Josh. Data is the real issue, quality, accessibility, governance, and data quality sucks. Any confidence yeah. will improve and how? So I'll, I'll use an HR example uh, for Josh because uh, I've given a bunch of production ones, you know. And, um, so to give you an idea, Josh, how screwed up it is on HR. If I want to be able to even report like how much time our employees took uh, of, out of their paid time off or vacation that they were able to dedicate towards some kind of social program. You know, they helped out local community deals, uh, uh, whatever. They volunteered their time for things. Think about this problem because in many companies, uh, global firms in particular, they have different payroll systems and HR systems in every single country that they operate in. 
they may not have a single kind of um, system to go after to go get that information. Or even if they can find out how much time they took, it may not be encoded the same way in every system. And then lastly, you get into things like, uh, and even if it's all in one place, I don't know what qualifies as diversity from one country to the next. Uh, so you have all these data definition, data meaning, data uh, consolidation problems. And, and if God help you, if it's in payroll, because there are all these different payroll engines all over the world, and you may need to pull information out of all of them, and it's all in a different format. So you're right, Josh, there are clearly some data problems. And it's one of the reasons why these manual efforts people use today to go vacuum clean ESG data out of all their various systems, they park it in like spreadsheets, and then they have to do all kinds of data massaging to get it to a standard uh, meaning and a standard uh, unit of measure and so forth. John's dying to say something, or he's going to laugh. Uh, no, it's all good. I'm just, I'm juggling comments and back end stuff. You're all okay. good, man. You're all okay. good. <clears throat> uh, Tracy says, we're still trying to wrap our heads around it. So it makes sense that it isn't completely systematized. It's exciting to see what happens. She's an optimist. We're starting to measure. So that is a good sign. No doubt about that. Brian, are you ready to uh, bring our special guest on? Oh, yeah. Anybody to help get me out of the hot Here seat. Here we go. <laughs> Tom. All Tom right. Tom Raftery. Hey, folks. How you doing? We got Tom. Tom. What a good sport. It's ridiculous <laughs> o'clock there. Well, you know, I came prepared. <laughs> all right. Oh, well, absolutely. After, it's after 5 p.m. here in Europe, so it's 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 all good. <laughs> in, indeed, much appreciated. I've, I've got Dr. Pepper in my SAP Reba live <laughs> uh, mug, but anyway. If anyone if anyone's wondering why Tom's here, I'm disappointed because man, back when sustainability was just a brochure. Tom was doing Green Monk stuff, toughing it out, duking it out, trying to get that Tom Raftery balance of of hardcore realism and optimism. And Tom, you're still doing it, man. You're still posting on LinkedIn. You're still fighting around with this topic and trying to make sense of it. Welcome. Sure. Sure. Yeah, no, I am. Um, to your point, uh, I was with SAP for a few years. Uh, was with Red Monk, uh, you know, fronting the Green Monk branch of Red Monk for a few years. I've, I've been in this space since 2006, I want to say. So, you know, coming up on 17 years now, if my maths is correct, I'm, I'm crap at maths, but <laughs> yeah, it's a space I'm, I'm, I've, 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 I've been deeply, deeply, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a technologist. But I'm also, I, I'm a graduate biologist. And so sustainability for me has always been something that's been the core of who I am. And then I got into technology as well. And so the ability to be able to work at the intersection of technology and sustainability for me is awesome. And, you know, to a lot of what Brian is saying, the only way we're going to solve a lot of this stuff is through the digitization of processes, it's through technology, it's getting those measurements, it's having, you know, whether it's IoT or whatever, it's collecting data everywhere along the line, bringing it back into some kind of backend system, massaging it, you know, AIing it, analyticsing it, and then working on where the problems are and fixing those. So, Tom, you haven't seen Brian's opus yet, but based on our conversation today, do you have any any questions for him yourself or any reactions to what you've heard today? Um, I guess the the I, I missed the start of this. I missed the first couple of minutes, minutes of this. So apologies if this is going back over stuff. But I guess the the big question to Brian would be why, what what was. What was the genesis of this for you, Brian? What was it that made you decide to jump into this space, research it, and write this book? Uh, well, I've been covering ERP for more years than I want to admit, uh, at least three decades. And uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think folks are tired of reading what I have to say uh, on e ERP all the time because I seem to feel like I have to almost repeat myself. The, you know, the same problems, maybe different vendor names come in there. But I also have kids. And um, 
I don't feel that I should uh, walk away from an industry at some point whenever I do retire and leave it, leave the world or whatever in less better shape than the way I found it. There's got to be more to this world than just ERP. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. And what you don't know about me, I may be a very public person from writings and all that kind of stuff, but I'm actually a very private guy. And for example, I propagate all kinds of hardwood trees. I, I've mm -hmm. grown God knows how many different kinds of chestnuts and oak trees and hickory trees. Um, I have a ranch and I, you know, I don't allow anything like a herbicide, pesticides, whatever, like on, on those places. I, I think we need to, we all need to be good stewards of anything and everything we have, if not for, you know, our children, and everything else. Um, and Meg's probably going to throw that right at me at probably a success factors event if I get a chance <laughs> to ask a question. And she goes, sorry, Brian, you can't ask an ERP related question. Um, but yeah, that's a good question, Tom. And um, I actually put a little teaser of that in a kind of like a, a forward in the front of the book. But cool. Um, I look forward to checking it out, Brian. Hmm? I look forward to checking out the book. Okay. I'll send you a copy. Not a problem. So let's uh, uh, let's no, let's I wasn't have, looking let's, for a freebie, Brian. I'll, I'll go to Amazon. And no, buy it, no. So I, <laughs> I'd I'd rather have somebody read it who really knows the space because if they're going to throw up on it, I'd like to know about where the problem <laughs> is before too many copies get out there in the wild. Uh, I'm still waiting. Amazon supposedly sending me a bunch of uh, proof copies, and I haven't seen them show up yet, which is one of the reasons I don't have a physical book to put in, you know, up on the screen here today, but. Uh, but it's there. And before anybody asks, let me just say, I've got the Kindle version, the digital version of the book. It's right. formatted. It's got some kind of format problem that's hang hanging up in production, but it will be out. And I would encourage more people to get the electronic oh, yes. version of it uh, if we're going to be good stewards to the world. Sure. I'm going to have you both take a crack at this question if you'd like. This is a follow on from Maureen. Um, I, I want to kind of stay focused in this last segment on kind of what we're going to do about this, because I think it's really important on this topic to feel like there's constructive steps that we that we and the organizations we support can take. So Maureen's asking, are you seeing a connective factor between the orgs that are succeeding here? I would say short answer, not yet, because as I as I mentioned earlier in one of the comments, this is very immature. It's only really kicking off. I mean, this is this is financial accounting back in the 1930s, you know, just after the Wall Street crash when financial accounting just started to get its legs. But we can't wait 100 years for it to become as mature as financial accounting is today. So it's going to have to happen in the next three, four years. We're going to have to have that kind of maturity around this kind of reporting happen in the next three, four years. So we're we're still very early to this. But I think in the coming years, it is going to massively change and all organizations will require to report. I mean, even the SEC said it last year in their request for comments, they want all companies, they want large companies reporting by 2024 and all companies by 2025, out to scope three by 2025 and out to scope three for all companies by 2026. So this is coming. This is absolutely coming everywhere. It's not just the EU, it's also the US and all other geos as well. And it's not just that. I mean, even if you're not in the US or the EU, the carbon border adjustment tax regulations, for example, and the extended producer responsibility regs coming in in the EU will require anyone selling into the EU to be able to demonstrate that they are good corporate citizens. You know, it this is this is massive. This is massive. This is a, of a scale that people don't yet, I think, fully understand. And it is it is there or right around the corner. And so huge changes are coming. This is, and you know, for me, finally, I'm starting to see a lot of that. And I'm delighted. I'm absolutely delighted to see it's happening. I wish it happened 10 years ago. But you know, the fact that it's happening now is fantastic. I think you're right about the regulatory teeth. Uh, but I think there's more too, because now 
the way the software is trending and the technology is trending and energy is trending, you could talk to someone who doesn't give a crap about any of that stuff and says the regulations aren't going to hit me yet. You can go to them and say, well, how would you like to switch your plants to a, a cheaper source of energy for certain hours in a given day and go back and do arbitrage on that all day long? It, only an idiot would say no. Like, <laughs> like so even folks who want to be above the fray and and who think they can be, there's a there's a stronger and stronger business incentive now, which I think is another encouraging factor. Brian, what are your thoughts on all of this? So I, I think it was Maureen asked the question. I can't remember. Um, yep. So here's what I'd say. Uh, the answer is somewhat industry dependent at this time. If I look at like a professional services firm, their footprint is mostly office spaces and um, uh, air travel, among other things, and some commuting travel. They have a lot fewer variables to control and they're able to get their hands around some of those big uh, emissions issues um, uh, probably better than uh, like a uh, a manufacturer like an automobile manufacturer who's got an extraordinarily deep supply chain. Uh, they all have to meet the requirements. And to Tom's point, the requirements keep moving ever more down market. So we're seeing um, it moving into like mid-sized firms. And it's more critical to meet the regulations right now out of Western Europe and the moment. and But it's coming uh, to the North American market in a big way, too. Anyway, uh, one other thing I want to point out, though, relative to where the success is, one of the problem spots, I asked the uh, chief sustainability officer of one of the biggest consumer products firms on the planet, uh, point blank. I said, OK, by your own admission, you have 128 or something like that uh brands. Those are just brands. Think about all the individual products and SKUs wow. underneath that. Uh, they're in something like uh, uh, 84 countries, and you get the idea. They're big. They're complex. They also have manufacturing plants all over the world, along with distribution centers like. And I go, so what's the game plan on you know, really retooling all these, you know, facilities to be greener, better, and so forth, and maybe readjusting your transportation network so you don't have to move product as far to get it to the end customer. And I said, or, you know, have you built a factory of the future to figure out what is the art of the possible here? And she looked at me and just said, the only way we can get a really great green factory is to build a factory of the future because so much of what we have, we acquired and mm -hmm. every plant's different and it's all got different capital equipment and it's maybe not ideally situated. She goes, it may take us a couple decades to work our way out of some of those facilities and work into something much greener. Now I give her credit. She's being honest. And if anything, we all need to have, we can't have, we can't make great progress unless we're truly being honest with each other. And, uh, but, you know, for some companies, that is the future, that is their path forward is to create the factory, the future to nail it down and figure out how we're going to get real time granular data and put it that factory, the future where it really needs to be to best serve customers in its area or, or get the access to supplies in a low cost and low energy, you know, basis. A, a slightly different things. tack on that. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Um, yeah, sorry, John. A, a, slightly, a slightly different tag on that, Brian. I was speaking to a woman called Magali Anderson. And Magali is the chief sustainability officer of a company called Holsim. And Holsim are the largest producers of cement and concrete outside of China. They're a Swiss company. And she was saying, I mean, they've obviously got a massive emissions problem. And mm -hmm. she said, you know, they're doing lots of things huge programs to reduce the emissions and the production of concrete and cement, but they're also changing their business model. And I thought this was interesting. What they're doing now is if somebody approaches them and says, let's say, we want to build a bridge. And for this bridge, we're going to require 100,000 uh, cubic meters of concrete. What? Holsam are now saying is, show me your designs for that bridge and we'll work with you to 
produce the same bridge with the same structural integrity, but with 60% or 70% less concrete. You get the bridge, you get the emissions win, we get to, because one of the, one of the other things she said is, look, the, the, the orders we have for our products are, you know, outstripping our ability to supply them. So they're, they're able to change their business model and sell 60 to 70% less product to more people, keeping their emissions down, keeping the, 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 the uh, emissions down for their customers and selling them as well concrete, which is produced using less carbon intensive methods so it's it, it's it's not it, it there's a lot of left field thinking that's going to be required here as well this mm -hmm. this idea of changing their business model so that they're actually reducing the amount of concrete they're selling and selling it based on smarts you know based on smart engineering to give the same product for a lot less co2 produced for example in this case i thought that was a, a hugely interesting one as well you can so also, just, oh, you sorry, also see a lot, real quick, you'll also see a lot of companies that are now entombing carbon and other things into the concrete. So even if you can't use less concrete, you could park a lot of stuff in that concrete, whether it's foundry uh, sand or carbon dioxide or whatever, you could put it in there. But all good points. John. Thanks both. Uh, sorry to cut in, but I just want to make sure that our, our lively audience is uh, – Put on notice we're going to wind down in a little bit here so get your last comments and questions in for these two and let's work them into the conversation uh thanks by the way for all the excellent and sharp observations uh the live gut check is is invaluable and um, just a couple of quick things uh brian one of the cool things i like in your book is you have one two three and four year kind of plans action steps for companies which i think really kind of breaks this down into something of a maturity model. And uh, I think that's really cool uh, because it kind of speaks to the action, the action steps that are kind of necessary here. So I really like that aspect of what you did. You also have something really cool around the, you know, can your CEO answer these board and shareholder questions? I'm not going to read all of them, but you have questions like which of our products trigger the greatest carbon consumption? What are we doing about it? which right. suppliers are the best, worst carbon consumers, and so on. And I think those are really good questions. And uh, and on, on top of that, like uh, Tom is rejoining us here. Sorry, folks. Not hey, up. welcome back. No worries. Just kind of doing a couple things from Brian's book. He's got a that, – that, that we haven't covered yet. He's got a really good checklist of questions CIO, CEOs should be pestering. Uh, be ready to answer from their boards and stuff, which includes things like uh, uh, which suppliers are the, of ours are the best and worst carbon consumers and so on. It's a good challenging list. And Brian, I'm kind of thinking we may need to have an equivalent list for customers to ask their vendors in terms of what functionality you're providing. Because one of the things I really like about your report, your your book, I we should call it now, is, is how you – this provides a basis for customers to challenge vendors on how are you helping me to solve these problems? And, 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 and like we said, take this in a much more granular direction than just, you know, checking off the reporting boxes. So those are also some positive things to take from the book when you get your hands on it. And speaking of which we have a little debate on whether your book is actually available on Kindle or not. <laughs> so can you uh, resolve that? Is it actually there yet? It's not there yet. It will be okay. there hopefully in a few days, but okay. I, I've got some, this happened to be on another book I did where somehow I was able to get the old school paper book version of it out just like that. And then the Kindle book just was just grinding through some problems. Anyway, the thing about the kinds of questions, um, I did want to just tell you that uh, I don't know Tom's background other than I've known him over at like uh, SAP and other places over the years, but uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a um, client facing guy. That's the way I've, I, that's my whole career. Uh, and uh, the most deadly thing you, you can possess as a great um, client, client based kind of person is to have some great questions you ask that, tease out the answers. So the point of those questions was to get 
the um, ESG project team to like dig in, find the answers to these kind of things and learn about what's really going on there so that they can uh, do a better job of casting the project and moving it forward. That's why I put those things there. And they're not meant to be all inclusive. They're meant to like kickstart the kind of conversation and to uh, get people focused on the right kinds of issues and uh, topics moving forward. So let but me ask both of you. I appreciate me, you actually reading the appendix. That's uh, that's more than I would have thought somebody would have done. Uh, anyway. I made, well, you asked me to read the whole book, and I did. Um, but um, but anyway, uh, I wanted to ask both of you if you were essentially sitting with uh, some software vendors, and they were giving you platitudes about, and you were, let's say, you're a customer. You all can put yourselves in the shoes of customers. Let's say you're talking to a vendor. And they said, we've got you covered on sustainability. Oh, yeah, we've got this. We're we're very green solution now, blah, blah, blah. What would be a couple of your top questions you'd want to ask? I mean, obviously, I realize this is customer specific, so it depends on industry and stuff like that. But what would you really want to hear from a vendor in terms of are they taking this seriously for you? What would you ask them? Let me jump on that one first, Tom. I, oh. I normally like to sandbag and let somebody like you <laughs> kind of give the uh, school solution first, and I come in, you know, hard with something no one thought of. Uh, I think the big thing here is: is the solution the vendor is going to pitch me? Is it about reporting ESG data, or is it to help me do a better job of running my company in a better? Uh, ESG kind of fashion. And there's a huge difference between the two. And if it's strictly about the reporting, I'm going to yawn on that one. That just doesn't move the needle for me. It gets me out of a compliance problem possibly, but it doesn't change things materially for the long term. I want the doing is what I want. Tom? Yep, I would agree 100% with Brian. I would also say I would want people I'm in business with to be looking at the standards that are out there for reporting and not just for reporting, but things like the science based targets initiative to be looking at those and to have, uh, you know, science based targets, the science based target initiative is set up just to do that, to help organizations create targets that are science-based. And if you have companies that say to you, I'm working with the Science-Based Targets Initiative so that my targets are science-based, realistic, that they have been audited is too strong a word, but they've been checked and they are realistic and I have all these steps in place, then I can start to take them seriously. You know, but before that, I'm kind of, you know, to Brian's point, a little skeptical. So, Brian, of course, since you listed 50 or so vendors in this book, does that mean we can be expecting some type of Brian Summer Magic Quadrant here? Um, <laughs> no. So, the, uh, come on, no, man. We're waiting for the ESG the vendor rankings. Uh, no, I'm not picking any favorites. I don't. Uh, I didn't take any monies from any vendors. Um, I... And knowing that a book la can last a long time, I just put the vendors down, you know, a list of them and said, these are some you should investigate. And whether they stand up the test for time or not, I mean, I, my clients are not stupid people. They'll, they can run through that list and figure out what they do or don't like. I've categorized them uh, somewhat and, you know, and I'm pointing them into some of the right directions. This, my book's really, it's a playbook. It's not... It's not the definitive scientific guide to ESG. It's around what are you going to do if you're like a program lead uh, on an ESG, you know, program for your employer or you're the CEO or some other top executive. It's all the right kind of questions. It's a way to get organized, way to, you know, get your thinking straight about how you want to tackle it. But it, it's it's meant to be something you can read and go back and reread again and again if you need to, to reference some stuff and the same thing with these vendors it's here's some we ought to at least take a look at even if it's five minutes on the web we'd look at their website and see what's going on but sad to say no one gave me you know like a million dollars to go write the book and uh you know pimp them out um he that's what i like that's what i like that's what i like about the project though because it has it has a certain passion to it that that you put into it because you believed in what you were doing. And I think that comes right. out in the material. And and that's why I wanted to 
you know, spend some time with with you on this topic because I, I think it's really important. Now, uh, I want to head to last words. I want to thank Mohammed here for joining. Mohammed says the confluence of business continuity and ESG is another area of interest for SMB companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to give each of you a little bit of a last word, uh, but before I'm going to have my own little last word and say a few things, I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention that there's pretty good documentation of a generation of consumers that do care about this issue in their consumer spend. I don't think that's the main reason why things are changing, like some might say, and sometimes I get these over-enthusiastic PR pitches about it, but I do think it is worth noting, and we haven't touched on it here. I would also like to say that... uh, that uh, there are no externalities. <laughs> it's time for corporations to become good citizens of their communities, not just for business reasons. So fuck externalities. Let's get to work. Um, let's make this plan a little bit better. Uh, sorry, but I'm going off the fringes here at the end. And finally, um, I stand by my statement trashing Web3 in the metaverse and saying that generative AI might be the headline. But I think sustainability and ESG vendors are actually the undercard, the dark horse here in enterprise spending going forward the next few years. So I, I hope that that's worth something. Don't go out and buy some stock. But um, but I, 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 I really think this is important. So anyway, uh, uh, for the two of you, what what is your kind of final thoughts for today? What would you want the people in the audience to take from them in terms of this conversation? Where should they take this forward? You want me to go first, Brian? Yeah, go. Okay. <clears throat> so I think you're absolutely right, John. This is sustainability, ESG, whatever broad term we're using to cover it is not going away. It's not a flash in the pan. When it when it bubbled up in 2008, when I joined Red Monk, it was something that, you know, was fashionable just because of Al Gore and the Inconvenient Truth movie that came out a couple of years early, earlier. But then you had the crash in 2008 and people got distracted and went off in other directions. But now, particularly because of the Paris Climate Accord in 2015 and the commitments that countries have made, this is something that's not going away. And even more so, I mentioned in the comments, the uh, Fit for 2030 European mandate. That's a mandate. It's not a target. It's a mandate. It's a hard mandate for all 27 nations of the EU that we're going to reduce our emissions 55% by 2030. And to kind of put that in context, when... Uh, COVID hit in 2020, our emissions dropped 7%. And then in 2021, as we started to open up again, they went back up 5%. So between 2020 and 2021, we had a net drop in emissions of 2%. And we got a drop in 55% in the next six years. It's six years to 2030, just over six years. We got to drop them. And that's a, that's a legally binding mandate on all 27 nations of the EU. So the changes are, are, are going to happen. They're going to be extraordinary. They're going to be massive. And that 55% is the low-hanging fruit. You know, the other 45% in the system will need to be taken out in the following 20 years. And that's going to be even harder. So this is not a flash in the pan. This is going to get more and more and more important as we go on. So this is not something that, that to, to take lightly. And the other thing I would say purely uh, selfishly is that if anyone is interested in, 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 in this, obviously Brian's book is a great place to start, but also I've got two podcasts which relate, ex- well, not exclusively, which, 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 re- which are heavily related to this. One is the Digital Supply Chain Podcast, which goes out every Monday and Friday. It's uh, all about supply chain and the digitization of supply chain. And the other is the Climate Confident Podcast, which goes out every Wednesday, which is all about climate and positive stories and what's happening in the climate space. So if anyone is interested in finding out more, you know, obviously start with Brian's book. But if you're into podcasts, you know, I've got a few good podcasts there. The Climate Podcast has published 130-something episodes, and episode 338 of the Supply Chain Podcast went live this morning. Cool. Thanks for staying up late, Tom. Much appreciated. Uh, Clive, Clive says, uh, Clive, by the way, 
you come slightly earlier than 70 minutes in, we can spend more time on your question. But <laughs> how ESG is the vendor zone software? Does it scale up CPUs and scale down when not in use? Yeah, that, that kind of fits into the overall issue of like kind of how vendors are accountable to the things that are, they're practicing in this space. Brian, final thoughts. Take us home, man. So let's talk about something building off of Clive's point you just put up on the screen that didn't get any conversation today. Um, let's talk about where is all the energy going right now and driving up on the emissions. Data centers, cloud data centers, just a few years ago, barely even didn't even register 1% of the global emissions being generated. Now we're at 3.9% of global emissions are coming from cloud data centers. And part of the problem is because of all the things you talked about, John, the metaverse and all the generative AI and all the data that's being generated, stored, rehashed, reconfigured, yep. whatever, and repurposed, we're generating so much data that one author called data the ugly byproduct of, um, uh, of data manufacturing. And because all that's going on devices that have to be cooled or stored and powered up and everything else. So it's just another one of these areas where, you know, one of the things I would tell the listeners is you just keep looking at every little nook and cranny of your firm and you're going to find more pockets of places that are either contributing to the environmental issues or the social or governance issues. They're all there and you're going to have to be a great detective to find them all. And some of them are going to really surprise you. The, the data center one is something I put near the very back of the book, but it's one that just seems to be like in billboard magazine terms, it's like number 10, but with a bullet and it's going up. So um, that'll be one to watch. John. Excellent. Thanks all for joining. Excellent chat. This was a really memorable conversation and I'm sure we'll revisit this topic again. Thanks to both of you. Brian and I are going to be doing a monthly show, a monthly enterprise review. That's going to debut in August. We're going to see how that goes. Also, I have Melissa Swift coming up, who's an outspoken voice on the future of work. That's going to be cool. That's also mm -hmm. for August. But I'm going to take a vacation in the meantime. So that's going to be pretty cool. And that's it. Thanks for coming, everyone. Catch you later. Thanks for inviting me. See you.